Okay, well, I think we might get started, everyone. Uh, welcome to the webinar today on AI and data science for sustainable development. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands where we're meeting, uh, the people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Just to start with a few housekeeping issues first, uh, the webinar will be recorded and will be made available on the MSDI uh, site and uh, project team websites. Please uh, be patient with us if we have any uh, technical issues, but I think we're going okay so far. And uh, if you've got any questions for the panelists, please submit them via the Q&A function. So you'll see the Q&A function down at the uh, bottom of your screen. Please uh, use that. Uh, we'll cover as many of the questions we can get to in the time provided, and apologies if we don't get around to uh, your question. Uh, so what's today about? Well, this is a... A Monash event that's exploring the interface of sustainable development, AI and governance. And it's a collaboration of the Monash Sustainable Development Institute, <coughs> the Monash Data Futures Institute and the Better Policy and Governance Initiative. And I'm John Thwaites. I'm the chair of the uh, Monash Sustainable Development Institute. I've got a great interest, of course, in sustainable development, but I might say my first uh, degree was in computer science at Monash back in the days when uh, we all had punch cards, so there wasn't a lot of artificial intelligence <laughs> then. But today uh, we've got a, a surprise visitor, I might say. Uh, we're very, very uh, fortunate to have Professor Jeff Sachs here just to launch this project. Uh, and Jeff is preeminent in sustainable development around the world. He's a key advisor to the UN Secretary General on the Sustainable Development Goals. He is a professor, a university professor at Columbia University, but also we're very pleased to have Jeff as a distinguished visiting professor at Monash. But Jeff is probably more than anyone in the world, the person who has put digital technology for sustainable development on the global agenda. And in his nature paper on the six transformations that are needed to achieve sustainable development, Jeff identified digital technologies and the digital revolution as one of the key transformations. So, Jeff, welcome. I know you're just going from Zoom to Zoom. <laughs> You've been to the Pacific with me this morning. Then you're to, in China, as I understand. <laughs> and now you're going to briefly come here to launch this project. I know you have to go after that, and it's well past bedtime anyway in the small island state of Manhattan. <laughs> but, uh, Jeff, can I just briefly say this is an interdisciplinary project across Monash involving multiple faculties to determine how we can best use uh, artificial intelligence and digital technologies to advance sustainable development. So if I could just ask you to briefly launch the project, but also maybe say a few things about why you see this is so important for the achievement of the sustainable development goals. Thank you so much, John and uh, colleagues at the Data Futures Institute. Congratulations on the launch. Thank you for letting me be a very a small part of it. I'm uh, absolutely delighted to drop in. And uh, John's introduction reminded me how 44 years ago, as I was writing my undergraduate uh, thesis, uh, carrying big boxes of punch cards under my arm, uh, taking them over to the counter at the computer center, watching them fed through the card reader, and then waiting, waiting expectantly as uh, uh, the cards would be read and then the, uh, uh, the, the uh, large uh, paper uh, trail would be put back in the cubby hole for us to see whether we had uh, miscoded something and had to do it all again uh, throughout the day. 
So uh, that was 44 years ago. And since then, we have had uh, Moore's Law operating uh, basically every 18 months. Uh, and uh, we have had the uh, uh, billion fold improvements of our capacity to compute, uh, to transmit, to store data. Uh, and along with that uh, has come through uh, Moore's Law, the ability to take an idea of uh, Mr. Hinton from the 1970s and 80s that seemed unworkable once upon a time, a neural network, uh, and uh, actually through back propagation to create very sophisticated, unbelievably uh, sophisticated uh, 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 artificial intelligence systems that are uh, transforming how we understand everything, uh, how we understand what information is and how we understand what our brains are and how they work and how neural networks uh, work. Uh, it is an astounding uh, uh, thing to live through. It is our great revolution, in fact. Uh, and I'm a, a, a huge uh, fan and devotee of your field. Uh, I have hung around uh, DeepMind uh, over uh, recent years and uh, found uh, among all of the many, many breakthroughs of artificial intelligence, uh, perhaps most emotionally amazing to me, uh, how AlphaGo Zero uh, went and sat in a corner for a few hours and taught itself chess at the level of uh, superhuman uh, grandmaster level. Uh, and in a few hours of self-play from tabula rasa, from no expert inputs other than the rules itself, uh, became the greatest uh, chess master of history uh, and discovered in a few hours every great opening and its variations that had been learned over hundreds and hundreds of years of, of advanced human play. Oh my God, who could have known uh, that uh, putting numerical weights on a deep neural network could translate into chess at uh, superhuman skill? I don't think we knew. Or who could have known that to crack the code of machine translation would not be the efforts of linguists uh, and language specialists, but uh, a team that was able to do translation from Chinese to uh, English without knowing any Chinese at all, uh, other than having texts that could be read in to a deep uh, learning system. Uh, and Google showed that from pure numerical correlations of how uh, symbol, uh, how uh, um, Chinese characters uh, appear without any semantic knowledge, uh, any grammatical knowledge, uh, you can have a highly, highly functional uh, translation system. So we're learning a lot about the nature of knowledge itself. And because of uh, Moore's Law, uh, because of being able to have very deep learning, uh, hundreds and hundreds of layers uh, in uh, advanced uh, neural networks, uh, in convolutional networks, uh, what can be done now is astounding. So I don't think we know uh, the answer to the basic question of uh, where the limit really will be uh, of what AI can mean for sustainable development. But uh, you know, uh, and I uh, see it on your wonderful website of the projects of the Data's Futures Institute, and I made my own quick list of some of the areas where artificial intelligence systems will make a huge difference. And if you just uh, let me summarize my own list very, very briefly, I start with smart infrastructure. We need to move to a zero carbon energy system, to an energy efficient system, to intraday marketing of energy, to uh, flatten the curve of electricity use. I'm not talking about flattening the curve of the virus. I'm talking about uh, lowering uh, peak uh, energy demands for energy uh, efficiency. Uh, and so smart power grids, uh, of course, uh, smart uh, internet uh, networking, uh, efficient appliances and smart appliances, and being able to monitor complex infrastructure from afar. We don't need Homer Simpson sitting at the 
uh, at the uh, terminal of the nuclear plant <laughs> for our safety, we can monitor our infrastructure from a distance through uh, smart systems that are constantly doing uh, their own diagnostics of our uh, core infrastructure. That's number one. Number two, I believe smart mobility will play a huge difference. I'm a fan of uh, autonomous vehicles. They're already working on mine sites. They're working in agriculture for precision agriculture. And I'm sure that they're going to be working in the gridded streets of New York sometime in the future for e-commerce, for uh, deliveries of uh, goods and services, and they will be safer in my view. Uh, so we will figure out how to make smart self-driving vehicles work for human benefit. And this obviously is an area completely dependent on uh, artificial intelligence systems. A third area that is vital will be smart services. Uh, e-diagnostics already taking place. We have better imaging from machines than we do from expert radiologists who have been looking at uh, MRIs and other imaging for decades, but they're outperformed now by smart systems, for example, on macular degeneration, an area that DeepMind worked on. And uh, we know that uh, many parts of the world have no radiologists around, but who needs them if your phone can do it, uh, if your a computer can do it, or if you can do it uh, at least remotely. Uh, E-health in general, uh, with the already Watson from IBM uh, turned into a great repository of uh, rapid search through clinical cases, through diagnostics, and through a kind of uh, highly sophisticated Bayesian processing for making differential diagnostics. I think that this will play a huge role. I'm quite convinced that uh, e-learning will work with the individualized uh, student learning, uh, as well as uh, the online education that is part of our COVID world, but I think will be part of our lifelong world in the future. A, a fourth area that I've already mentioned that I think could be as influential and important for human well-being as any other is natural language, real-time processing. I think the Bible had it approximately right when uh, it interpreted the Tower of Babel, uh, the Babel of uh, thousands of languages as being the great obstacle of humanity to cooperation. Uh, so much of our hatred <laughs> so much of our war, so much of our enmity, so much of our lack of cooperation has been about linguistic divisions. Uh, when the Greeks called their foes barbarians, what they basically meant was they don't speak Greek. Uh, and now we should all have uh, our little uh, plugs in our ears that are giving us simultaneous real-time interpretation from any major language to any other major language uh, as a way to have normal interactions uh, across uh, uh, linguists or across the speakers of uh, different natural languages, I think this could be the road to peace. Oh, that's what you meant. Uh, as long as the systems don't mistranslate uh, and uh, get it right, I think natural language processing is extraordinarily important for a cooperative world. So if uh, the Data Futures Institute can come up with that, uh, please do so. Uh, a fifth area that I think is extremely important is remote sensing. Uh, of course, we have low Earth orbital satellites uh, taking uh, pictures of uh, the planet twice a day. Uh, on all parts of the planet. Uh, this enables us to watch where forest fires are raging, uh, where uh, uh, pollution plumes and air quality are threatening human health, uh, where other weather anomalies, uh, heat waves or uh, droughts uh, and other conditions are occurring, where deforestation is taking place. Uh, where forest fires uh, are blazing, where illegal fisheries, uh, fishing is operating. Uh, we were just on a call with the Pacific Island countries complaining about all the illegal fishing in their waters. 
the satellites can watch where those ships are and who's doing it. And with uh, AI systems, we could bring under control a lot of this uh, illegal fishing activity. And then finally, all in this line, if we can aggregate big data and aggregate remote sensing data and use smart systems, we can get real-time SDG indicators. We've set up at SDSN recently a portal called SDGs Today, which aims to curate real-time data on the sustainable development goals, whether it's rates of deforestation uh, or fisheries or crop failures or extreme weather events uh, and so on. We know using uh, uh, sophisticated uh, machine learning systems, we can turn satellite readings of the night lights and perhaps the uh, rooftops, uh, whether they're uh, thatched roofs or metal roofs, into uh, uh, proven models of poverty, for example. So we should be able to have real-time indicators of poverty in the world, not by expensive and uh, 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 household surveys, but by satellite observation that are also ground-tested and ground-truthed uh, with the machine learning algorithms. So I would like to see us develop real-time SDG data. Why real-time? So that we can use it for holding our governments to account, so that we can use it for SDG management practices, uh, so that we can uh, use it for uh, emergency humanitarian response activities. All of these require information and artificial intelligence is our powerful tool for bringing together big data, remote sensing, uh, and all of the massive terabytes of flows of data uh, in the world in a sensible way. So just uh, some thoughts that come to mind, but I'm a huge fan and uh, very excited to be part of uh, the launch today and I uh, am eager to hear, uh, especially from John after the launch, some of the areas of activity uh, and hope that SDSN can give you some support in this great new mission. Thank you so much, Jeff. And there couldn't be a better way to launch this whole project than the inspiration that you've given us and the very concrete ideas as well, which we should pursue. Jeff, can I uh, thank you and say it's time for bed? Uh, okay. And, uh, <laughs> Fair enough. It and, starts uh, early in a few we, hours again. <laughs> we, we, and, but I will keep you informed of the progress of this project, and we will be working closely with SDSN on the SDG and data futures. So thank you. Fantastic. Take care. Congratulations, everybody. So that was a great way to start. And a great partnership, I think, for the projects that we're going to hear about today. I'm going to launch right into it now and ask Mitzi Bolton uh, to talk about her project on artificial intelligence and governance, because, of course, that is going to be a key uh, determinant of whether there's political and community support for the use of artificial intelligence. Mitzi. Thanks, John. And uh, thanks to Jeff as well. I'm not sure if he's still on the line, but that was a wonderful introduction. All right, bear with me a moment and we'll get going. All right. Uh, like John, I also want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land I'm joining you from today, who are the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Uh, as John said, my name is Mitzi Bolton and I'm a research fellow here at, the, at MSDI. Uh, but the work that I'm presenting today isn't mine alone. It's an interdisciplinary project leveraging the expertise of folks across MSDI, as well as the Data Futures Institute and the Faculty of IT and the Better Governance and Policy Initiative in the Faculty of Arts. Together, we're bringing uh, we, a lot of expertise across a broad range of areas to try to address some complex problems, some of those problems that Jeff just uh, spoke to. Uh, and in particular, we're really interested in governance. So... I'm sure you can think of government decisions that, despite best intentions, have resulted in less than ideal outcomes, not just in Victoria or Australia, but across the globe. 
Uh, if, if you can't, maybe you can just live in this wonderful world where everything works wonderfully. Um, here's a few examples that can arguably be linked back to some of those public decisions. Uh, so we've got the exceedance of planetary boundaries and uh, our response to this knowledge. We've got extreme bushfires in both hemispheres with resulting smoke plumes visible from space. You can see the Australian bushfires in January on the left and the more recent American bushfires in September on the right. And we're also seeing those fires taking place in areas we wouldn't traditionally expect to burn, such as rainforests. We've got recurring bleaching of the Great Barrier Reef, which has economic and social impacts, as well as the obvious environmental ones. Continuing arguments over water entitlements in the Murray-Darling Basin. Uh, misfired attempts at economic stimulus, if you think back to the last time we were trying to stimulate the economy in Australia. And some would say Victoria's handling of hotel quarantine. Now, all of these come, what, come together somewhat when you consider progress on the SDGs, as Jeff was just talking to. And the SDGs were a framework put in place to deliver a good life for all. But uh, this year's progress report shows that globally, we're largely not on track to achieve them by 2030. And even for high income countries, as is shown on the screen now, challenges remain in 14 of the 17 goals. Within Australia, uh, some work's been done by Alan et al recently looking at our progress and the targets which sit beneath the goals. And they found that we're only on track for about a third of those targets and a number of those we were doing well on before the SDG. So it's not like that decision to work toward the SDGs is catalyzing action. So I've barely scratched the surface here and I'm sure you can think of other examples, but what this collage is sort of intended to illustrate is a great unrealized ambition for optimal public outcomes. And so the, the next question then becomes, well, why is that? Why aren't our decision makers achieving what they set out to? Well, I've argued, and I would explain in more detail if I had the time, that it's the complexity and ambiguity of their operating environment. So there's at least 40 interlinked factors that push and pull them to and from those desired outcomes. And these factors are what make policy making a grey science rather than a black and white one. If we combine all of those factors with what's known about human decision making capacity, it would seem that public decision makers are struggling to, to achieve the desired outcomes because of the complexity of the decision making environment, which we humans just aren't wired to deal with. So what can we do about that? Well, whoop. AI might be one of the things that can help us. It's not a silver bullet, we're not saying that, but it may well help um, to move things along. Now, before Jeff spoke, um, if you're like me, when you first thought of AI, or if you're like 50% of the people that Selwyn et al uh, surveyed, the first thing that comes to mind might be a robot or a computer, and hopefully it's the more cheerful robots and, and not a terrifying future. Um, but as, it, as noted on the screen and as Jeff talked to, AI and machine learning can be so much more than this. Uh, we envisage that AI might be able to support decision makers when it comes to collecting, making sense of and addressing gaps in the available evidence, as well as identifying novel sources of, of reliable evidence, which can then be used to support policy development and implementation. And, and we are actually particularly keen to explore the use of Earth observations. So those satellites that Jeff was talking about, which are literally observing the Earth and telling us things like temperature and um, how much chlorophyll is in water and all these sort of fun things. We're looking to use those um, as well as Bayesian networks, which is a form of probabilistic modeling. And we're hoping that they can help us help public decision makers. So that all sounds terrific, but just because there's a lot of promise in AI and researchers have shown that it can achieve the points I raised, that doesn't necessarily mean that applying it to public, public problems will result in the outcomes that we're wanting. AI also has biases and there are concerns um, that I'm sure you're familiar with around ethics and overreach. And, and similarly, it's well documented that developing new tools for policymakers doesn't mean they'll necessarily be taken up. So what we're doing is undertaking policy science research in parallel to data science research. And if you're a public servant, we would love for you to participate in our survey and share it widely. There's a short link you can see on the screen and you can also access it via our website. Um, what we wanna know is what do you want when it comes to data and evidence? What are your concerns and, and hopes for AI? What are you excited about? And what policy areas and principles are priorities for you? Where are those pain points? That way, we can ensure that the AI tools we're developing might genuinely help to make that operating environment a little less complex and lead to better informed decision makers and improve public outcomes such as achievement of the SDGs. So I'll leave it there. Um, thanks very much for joining us today and happy to take your questions later on or offline. And back to you, John.
Thanks very much, uh, Mitzi. And given the time, I think we might jump straight to Paul Sarter, who's going to be the next presenter. And Paul is presenting on data science pathways for sustainable livelihoods in remote Indigenous Australia. Paul. Yeah, thanks, John, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, and of course, I'd like to begin by, uh, you know, extending the acknowledgement that John and Mitzi have made uh, to pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging, both here on Wurundjeri country and across Australia and the Torres Strait Island, and further take a moment uh, to um, acknowledge the significance of Indigenous knowledge, which across many cultures and for thousands of years has known that uh, the well-being and prosperity of people uh, is uh, deeply rooted in the well-being and prosperity of their context and their environment. And I think that's something that really sits at the essence of sustainable development. Um, and of course, in the context uh, of, of this research, uh, that um, uh, importance of Indigenous knowledge, um, you know, comes to bear through a, a project that is uh, co-owned and co-led by the Yinchinga Aboriginal Corporation, the Olkala Aboriginal Corporation, in partnership with the Centre for Appropriate Technology and, of course, an interdisciplinary research team here at Monash University and the University of Melbourne, which is effectively seeking to understand how these new frontiers of data science and AR technologies, when placed alongside that Indigenous context and that Indigenous knowledge can support the sustainable livelihoods of Olkala and uh, Lama Lama traditional owners on their traditional homelands. Now, I'd like for you uh, to uh, perhaps imagine, and, and for those in Melbourne, maybe even romanticise um, the notion of jumping on a plane and, and flying up to uh, Cairns in northern Queensland. And then from there, you get in a four-wheel drive and you drive eight hours um, completely north from Cairns and it's here that you'll find the traditional homelands of the Okla people and a further three to four hours to the northeast from there you'll uh, come across the traditional homelands of the Lama Lama people. Now this remoteness is a common characteristic of many of the Indigenous homelands throughout Australia and the Torres Strait Island and as you can imagine it brings with it really significant challenges when it comes to supporting a sustainable livelihood uh, within these contexts. Now, these challenges are equally matched by the deep-seated connection and knowledge that traditional owners have of their contexts. And as Uncle Mike Ross, uh, Okula Elder and uh, Chairman of the Okula Corporation, demonstrates in this statement, uh, there is also a rich desire and appetite for innovative tools and approaches to ensuring the preservation and prosperity of uh, that culture and country and the people that reside within it. Um, and it's at this interface that data science and AI technologies provide a really uh, rich opportunity uh, to, to support. Uh, but of course, decisions about country need first and foremost to be made by traditional owners on their homelands. And at the same time, in order for them to be able to make these decisions, there's a requirement to be uh, ensuring that traditional owners have an understanding of the sorts of uh, opportunities that new technologies such as data science and AI provide. So in this sense, our question is not so much simply about what opportunities can data sciences present bring to support traditional owners, it's also about what is an appropriate pathway to empowering traditional owners with the necessary knowledge and skills and capabilities for them to harness these technologies to support their future aspirations. Um, so to establish this, we've developed a process of two-way knowledge exchange, and this is uh, premised on the notion of deep listening, a process where we host traditional owners down at our universities and over the course of a few weeks uh, begin engaging them in the different sorts of data science technologies and projects that are currently happening and um, show them the sorts of potential that these technologies have. Following that, we then uh, take the university team up on country and begin engaging with the Indigenous homelands context and with traditional owners having conversations around uh, the sorts of opportunities that exist and, of course, um, the uh, you know, potential uh, of what a architecture, a 
around a community-led data science platform might be to support their future aspirations. Now, you might be wondering, geez, uh, you know, this has come a very long way in, uh, you know, in, in over the course of this year, given the circumstances. And of course, uh, our response to that is we are still very much in the early days. Obviously, the uh, lockdowns and, and lack of ability to, to travel has, has hindered our processes of these field work. But earlier in the year, we were able to get up uh, uh, to you know North Queensland and begin having some early conversations and through these and some existing preliminary strategic planning that traditional owner groups have done um, we were able to already begin identifying some of the rich potential that data science technologies can bring to the Indigenous homelands context. So imagine for example the use of drones and um, drone-based satellite technology in monitoring hydrological regimes and then the development of um, you know drone of uh, you know, uh, VR-based interfaces or, or data science interfaces to harness this technology alongside traditional owner knowledge. And then, of course, the use of VR and AR technology to visualise this data and support land management and infrastructure processes. And then additionally, finally, allowing, um, you know, things like uh, micro desalination technology, which has been developed at Monash University to be implemented and uh, you know, its maintenance and ongoing management supported through these data science platforms. Um, so hopefully that provides you with a bit of an insight uh, into the sorts of opportunities that data science can bring to this context. But of course, in order for us to achieve this, it does require us as a university to think a little bit differently where in the past, as we have sought to sort of use data science to answer a research question in this context, we need to be thinking first and foremost about what the outcome is, who the stakeholders uh, in the, you know, are and, and what their context is, and therefore what a process needs to be in order to uh, engage those stakeholders and empower them to achieve those outcomes using data science. Uh, so I'll leave it there and, and thanks very much. And back to you, John. Thanks very much, Paul. And that looks like a fascinating project, but I think it's great you've highlighted this importance of not just focusing on the data science, but how's it going to be used and how is it going to impact on different communities and very importantly on traditional owners and Indigenous communities. So thanks for that. Now uh, we're turning now to Dr. Reed Tingley and Associate Professor Alan Doran who are going to be talking about uh, machine learning and predicting species responses to global change. Thanks, John. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'm representing the Faculty of Science uh, here today. Uh, my colleague who will be presenting with me, uh, Associate Professor Alan Doran, is from the Faculty of IT, and um, our project uh, involves a much broader team across these two faculties. And our project really focuses on bringing together diverse data sources, uh, machine learning and AI to understand and predict species responses uh, to global change. And so it's becoming increasingly apparent that species distributions are shifting in response to anthropogenic drivers. Uh, and this has important implications for ecosystem health, uh, human well-being, and is of course relevant to the UN's uh, sustainable development goals. But it's not just native species that are shifting their distributions in response to global change. It's also alien species, those species that have been introduced outside of their native geographic range. Uh, and this is a major concern and relevant to uh, a number of the sustainable development goals. Um, for example, um, one of the targets of uh, SDG 15 is that by 2030, we reduce the impact and limit the spread of these alien species. So how can we go about uh, achieving this target? Well, first we need some data. Uh, and so this includes data on how alien species are spreading across landscapes, their impacts uh, on native systems and the types of interventions that people are uh, employing to try to limit this spread and impact. And of course, these data come from a diverse array of sources. And so our project is really about bringing together uh, new and diverse data sources uh, to try to inform sustainable development goals uh, and targets such as this one. Essentially, what we're trying to do is fill this sort of three-dimensional data cube, if you will, where we have information on uh, species distributions and their impacts, 
uh, at particular locations at particular times. And the reason why this is uh, a, 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 a an important thing to tackle is that once we have these data, we can then start develop, to develop indicators. And so these indicators can be things like the number of species that are spreading through different biosecurity pathways, uh, the number of species uh, that are having impacts on, on, on native biodiversity and ecosystems, and the amount of interventions and types of interventions that are being performed. So once we have these indicators, we can then monitor our progress towards these types of targets. But of course, it doesn't just finish there. Once we know how we're tracking towards our targets, we can then think, uh, we can then en enact some sort of management action, whether that's to eradicate or mitigate biodiversity impacts. Um, and that again, feeds into this new data cycle. And so it's sort of a continuous uh, process whereby we're collecting data from diverse sources. And Alan will talk in a minute about um, what exactly we, uh, we're talking about when we talk about uh, diverse data sources, but bringing these together to try to inform um, the SDG goals. Um, and is all, as is often the case, the best way to tackle these sort of big challenges is to focus in on a case study and develop the technologies and tools and the framework um, using a, a real world problem. And we've decided to uh, apply this framework that we're developing to the cane toad invasion here in Australia. Many of you would be familiar with this species. It was introduced along the east coast of Australia in the 30s uh, and has since spread widely throughout New South Wales, Queensland, across the top end, and is now invading the Kimberleys. Uh, and what's, a really, what's really great about this invasion is that it's a very high profile one. We know exactly where the toads were introduced and how they've spread over time. It's also a species that's had significant biodiversity impacts. And so it's really a, a model system for developing and, and testing the, the framework uh, that we're developing for understanding and predicting uh, species responses to environmental change. And so I'll hand over to Alan now, we'll talk a bit more about the types of uh, data sources that we're looking to bring together. Thanks very much, Reeves. So as you can see laid out on the right hand side here at the bottom, we've got the, the target, the goal of the research that Reeves already pointed out and that's to understand the invasion risk and the trajectory of cane toads uh, across Australia. Now, to make this kind of um, predictions, what we use are computer models of different types that I'll talk about in a short moment. But as Reid also indicated with regard to the cube that he showed you before, we need an awful lot of data to make this model uh, meaningful and to give, it, uh, to give it value for our goal. Traditionally, we use data, as you can see at the bottom of the slide in the green box, from ecological sources that has been collected with a specific intention of addressing ecological problems. Uh, just above that, you can see we have for many years now been using citizen science projects as well, which may or may not present their data in such a way as to be reusable, repurposable, um, and it may or may not conform to the expectations we place on data such as the iNaturalist or GBIF at the bottom. However, really the focus of our research project is to take new techniques in machine learning, computer vision and so on, and to seek data sources that are not traditionally associated with ecological research. And these are all uh, up here at the top in the, the pink boxes, uh, and I'll talk about them quickly one at a time. So next slide, please. So here you can see laid out from left to right, what we might call sort of non-traditional uh, data sources. So Flickr, Twitter, and Facebook are obviously generic systems set up for presenting a wide variety of social activities. But with AI and machine learning, we can actually uh, plunder these sources of data, if you like, and convert them into data that, that meets the ecological expectations we require for our study. And going across here towards the citizen science, we see progressively uh, improved, higher quality, highly filtered uh, data sources uh, that require a little bit less pre-processing. Next slide. We're also investigating the use of eDNA, environmental DNA, reads an expert at this. So as organisms move through an ecosystem, they leave traces of their DNA, especially in the water uh, in, a, in an area. And it's possible for us to therefore sample organisms and observe their presence, even if traditional uh, surveys might have overlooked that. Next slide. 
Another thing that many organisms do is make sounds. And because acoustic recognition uh, can be developed as we're doing here, Bernd Meyer's working on this in our team, uh, can be developed in a, a portable, lightweight, and long-lived uh, monitoring device, it's possible then to sample the acoustic signature of organisms from across a country or a continent as wide as Australia quite cheaply. Moving on to the next slide. So we'll integrate basically two different kinds of model, um, taking into account all of this data. Spatial distribution models look widely at the movement of populations across large landscapes. But we also use individual based models which have individual AIs, you might say, which control the movement of an individual organism, such as a single cane toad. And once we amalgamate these two models and calibrate them and validate them against the data we've acquired, uh, then we're able to predict the spread and the impact of a species and estimate the management effort that's required for us to control it. Next slide. So whilst we're talking specifically about cane toads here, of course, really what we're saying applies to countless other species. Uh, not just cane toads and will enable us to address the sustainable development goals, especially in relation to environment and life on land. Thanks. Back to you, John. Great. Well, thanks very much for that. And uh, I think you can see me now. Yes, thanks very much for that. We'll now move on to Dr. Masita Anwar, uh, whose project is Net Zero Precincts, Citizen Data Commons and Technological Sovereignty, using the Monash Net Zero Precincts as a, a base for that project. Thank you, John. Hi, everyone. Um, let me share my screen first. Okay, um, thank you, uh, John, um, and thank you to the webinar, webinar organizer to, for giving us the opportunity to present a summary of our project. This is a multidisciplinary collaboration of our team here uh, from FIT, MSDI, MADA, and Simon Fraser University in Canada. Today, I'm presenting insight from our study, which seeks to engage prison citizens, uh, including residents, local employees, um, uh, as well as university staffs and students uh, through a participatory process to develop recommendations for best practice on community engagement in data governance in the Monas Net Zero Precinct. Um, our work is situated within the Net Zero Precinct program, which is part of the Net Zero initiatives at Monas University. While um, data and Digital techniques, including AI, is an important part of the net zero transition initiatives. Um, limited research has been undertaken um, on data governance and smart city development in the context of local sustainability initiatives. So our work addressed this gap by investigating the role of community engagement in data governance for the net zero pricing. Our research is primarily interested in understanding the implications of for empowering community community engagement in data governance um, at the reset, at the precinct scale. So um, this is our project phase. It can, uh, as you see here, we have run a series of two participatory engagement workshop with um, precinct citizens. Uh, and we, we discuss perceptions, practices, expectations, and uncertainties um, in relation to data governance and concern about uh, data collection use and ownerships. We use human-centered design to enable participants to develop rapid prototypes of a processes or services program, vision tool or resources. Uh, and the team collaboratively develop data um, governance prototypes. Uh, for example, there was one on a method of building uh, public awareness and communications around energy. And there is also another one, uh, uh, like a data cafe, similar to repair cafe, 
where community can share, compare, and learn from others that are used. Then we take these insights and conduct a set of interviews using multi-criteria mapping, which is a participatory evaluation method for exploring contrasting perspectives on the prototypes developed. So we are now in the process of developing our findings and disseminating uh, the results to stakeholders and, and community practice. So the results of our empirical um, data reveals a number of uh, uh, interesting emerging insights. Our first, our participatory methods have to date surfaced a diverse set of rich information about community perceptions, practices and expectations, as well as uncertainties related to data governance. The multiplicity of ideas and perspectives generated by our small group of stakeholders suggests that pluralism is an important consideration in the design of data governance framework that if you like integrate community engagement into governance processes. Um, our work also suggests that precinct citizens can play a role in identifying useful data sets and standards, shaping values and principles and participating in decision-making processes. There is also consensus on the need to strengthen citizens through agency, through data literacy and creation of deliberate spaces for community consultation uh, and feedback are crucial in data governance design. Uh, but at the same time, concerns about security and privacy and the, the general lack of transparency is hand, in handling citizens' data points to in the importance of trust and ethics uh, in the implementation of data governance um, stewardship practices. So a couple of final points around the relevance and of, of the project and what we envisage as the next steps. From a research perspective, um, we are interested in understanding how institutional arrangements can become more responsive to community engagement through multi-stakeholder multi gov governance and uh, support decarbonization goals. And then from a practical perspective, um, we would like to uh, welcome, we will, we will welcome the opportunity to trial, uh, develop or, or extend our participatory approaches with data governance practitioners, policy makers and the wider organizations in a, in a variety of settings. Lastly, um, we invite you to download our recent discussion paper presented to the Data for Policy Conference using the link here. Thank you so much. Thanks, John. Well, thank you very much, Masita. And I think that project really clearly demonstrates why it's so important that all of these projects are interdisciplinary and we're calling upon the social sciences as well as data sciences to ensure that we've got proper governance of the implementation of AI and data technologies. Mm -hmm. Now, before we go to the next uh, project, which Klaus Ackerman will be talking about, can I urge everyone to put any questions that they have in the Q&A frame at the bottom of your screen? Uh, if we can start getting the Q&As now, um, I'll have a chance to have a look through them before the panel session starts. So any questions you've got, Put them in now and who you'd like to ask them of. So our last um, project is Dr. Klaus Ackerman, who's going to be talking about predicting flood risk, the case of the Chittorum River in Indonesia. Klaus. Thanks, John. So my name is Klaus Ackerman. I'm from Solar Labs and the Econometrics Department at the Monarch Business School. And this is joint work with Jane Holden, from MSDI and Christian Ulrich from the Department of Civil Engineering here at Monash. So what's the problem we are talking about? Floods have devastating effects and floods have been increasing over the last years, especially due to rapid uh, rapidization in urbanization and in climate change. And 
if you think about the problem, how it is in developing countries, it's flood also brings uh, illnesses because those, the water quality is not the best. And if you have flooded areas, disease follows. The usual approach to detecting floods is based on hydrological models, which require a lot of data and also very accurate data. And this data just does not exist in a developing context. So the idea is, we had is, okay, let's make use of remote sensing and deep neural networks to see how we can tackle this. And what we thought is, all right, let's make us use of radar satellite images. Because the good thing about radar is you can see through the clouds. While if you look at colorful images, if you have a cloud, you can't see anything. And that's why we decided, okay, let's give this a try. Let's see if you can make use of the Sentinel-1 satellite. Using satellite data, which is freely available, also has its challenges. If you look at this map, this is the daily re re revisit time. And as you can see, as the, as the satellite is from Europe, in Europe, you get great coverage every single day. But for Indonesia or for Australia, the coverage is not so great. But nevertheless, every few days, you get a reliable data source. So how does this gray data look like? Uh, so this is like satellite data from radar converted into grayscale. So if you look at those images, um, water has quite a distinctive signature. Even if, if it's a big river, with the bare eye, you can see, okay, here there's water flowing. Yeah? It gets a bit more tricky as you move into a vegetation environment where you have wetlands or urban surfaces and water colliding because then you get all the reflections from the radar images and then the picture gets kind of blurry. So what we thought we did is, okay, instead of trying to figure out when has uh, the water ex body expanded, so when it is flooded, let us try to build a general model that takes any given radar images and tells us if there's water. And for this, we are making use of the uh, NLCD land cover map, which is a, from a US land cover map, which kind of classifies the land in 2016 into uh, built up areas, water and wetland. This is one of the most detailed map in the world, but it only exists for the US and only for one year. But what we said, okay, if we can make use of our satellite images here, the X, and try to predict water at one time point, ideally this model will be stable enough to predict across time. So just quickly about the background, that we had to come up with some new, uh, new model architecture to get this going. So to show what the results, what does this mean? This is our examples on our test set. Here on the left, we have our input image. In the middle, we have our mask, meaning that's our target. On the right, we have our predictions. And as you can see, the, the, resolu the resolution gap could be fixed by our model. Meaning, because we had so much data, we were able to correct the inaccuracies between the satellites. So others have tried this same approach as well. So this is one of the recent publication from uh, one of the projects which is used by the UNITA. But if you look at this, you can kind of see, yes, they kind of predicted where the water is, but the site is getting, it seems to be straight as, as that is red everywhere. How do our results look like? This is our current prototype. As you can see here, this is the river in Indonesia. And you can see that across five years, and you can see how the water body is expanding and shrinking. Yeah? Also during dry season, it completely dries up. And our hope is that with that, we can provide a flood risk map for anywhere in the developing world. All right, back to you, John. If you could just un, uh, get out of the screen, that's good. Thank you. 
Okay, well, that was a fantastic series of presentations and raised some really interesting points. And I might uh, just open up the discussion and also urge uh, people who are on the webinar to put their Q&A in the uh, spot down the bottom of the screen there. But if I could just start uh, maybe by asking you, Masita, uh, in your experience, how do you think we can best engage with communities from different cultural and language backgrounds as we are seeking to get their input into these data science projects? Oh, wow. Great question, John, um, because this is precisely what we are aiming to provide as one of the recommendations. Um, I'd say participatory approaches is very suitable. Um, but more importantly is the awareness of the community diversity and, and trying to reach a, as wide a range of participants as possible. Um, we also need to pay attention um, to the diverse background accessibility and also the balance between those who are already in the knowledge space and, and those who are not. And also to make sure, uh, I guess, that the term are conveyed in a way that community can relate to. Um, for example, um, how do you explain something abstract um, like data governance in a community? Um, the, and the way we did this in our, um, the, the, the answer could be data literacy. Um, but the way we did this in our workshop, for example, is um, rather than uh, using the, the, that abstract term, we're asking uh, participants um, around what their uh, uh, perceptions, uh, practices or expectations or uncertainties around data. And from there, we can work uh, towards the, uh, inter the topic of interest. Great, thanks, Masita. And Paul Sata, if I could ask you a question that has a link to that in your project working with traditional owners, what sort of attitudes are the traditional owners communicating to you about uh, the use of artificial intelligence? And how can we begin to use the uh, systems of knowledge that traditional owners have used to inform our project? So are we actually gonna change or are we just going to um, have a communication about what we're doing? How, how are traditional owners gonna change what we're doing? Well, that, that's, a, that's a very big question, John, and, and a good one. Um, my sense is perhaps to, to build on, on Melita's perspective, um, is that I think uh, traditionally there, there's been a tendency to, um, to think that, uh, you know, the di different communities that we're seeking to engage um, or, or may potentially be able to support with data sciences are, uh, are simply sitting around uh, sort of waiting for us to turn up with our technologies that we can then, um, you know, show them how it works, which um, is inherently not the case. And particularly, uh, you know, this has been a, a, a key or, or a common experience throughout the Indigenous context. Um, traditional owners are busy and they are um, and in any project, I think two critical points of consideration at the outset need to be encompassed. The first being uh, having respect for their time um, and ensuring you're resourcing that appropriately. And secondly, recognising that um, these processes often extend beyond a one, two or five year project cycle. So bringing in uh, partners that are critically active on the ground and will remain active is, is a of, of vital importance, potentially as a first step. Um, and perhaps um, having conversations with those sorts of uh, actors first can be a, a more appropriate approach. In terms of traditional owner knowledge, um, this uh, I think is, is where, um, you know, the, the governance of data science and technology has um, a fair bit of work to do. Um, you know, with the use of, of new technologies and systems, often there's a, a common sort of, um, you know, or a traditional process around applying these tools to extract knowledge and to be harnessing knowledge. 
um, where in the traditional owner context, there is knowledge that, um, you know, is uh, protected or is um, sacred to particular traditional owners and is not necessarily knowledge that um, is culturally appropriate to be extracted or, or should be shared. So a first point of consideration in, in how we engage with traditional knowledge really needs to be how we have conversations with traditional owners about what that engagement should look like. Um, and therefore what an appropriate process um, and appropriate agreements might be around what knowledge uh, can and can't be made available. Okay, well, that's great. Look, I've got a couple of questions here for Klaus. Uh, first, and a fairly uh, technical question in one sense, but it's for saying, Klaus, thanks for such an awesome presentation. My question, what kind of algorithm are you using and how long does it take to run? Also, on what kind of hardware cloud service? And the second question to Klaus is, how does he envisage an AI-based flood risk prediction model be used in Indonesia to improve flood mitigation emergency responses? So that's pretty general, Klaus, but if you could keep your answer to, to those reasonably brief. Yes, so on the first point, um, we just uh, we used 7,000 hand-selected training images on, on the segmentation mask. Training takes a day, prediction takes uh, 300 milliseconds per image. So yeah, as soon as it's trained, it's very fast. And on the second question, uh, how can this be used? Well, the thing is you have people living there and people are moving around with the expectation in Indonesia that uh, will not be a flood. And our hope is of having maps over five years, we can say, well, if you build something here, there's a high likelihood that within one in four years, you might be flooded. So it kind of can help how people locate and where to build up dams. Because the next problem is if you build up a dam, you might just flood someone down the stream somewhere else. So yeah, that's, that's my response. Great, thanks, Klaus. Mitzi, I've got a question for you. Uh, what can public decision makers do? Policy makers, uh, um, public servants do, or what sh should they know to mainstream artificial intelligence into policy processes? There's probably two questions in that. I guess the sh what should they know? Well, I came to MSDI from the public sector and when I came to MSDI, my understanding of AI and machine learning was sort of built from watching Black Mirror. And so I guess um, one thing to know is that it's not all techie robo debt and surveillance and it doesn't have to be as, it's not scary or complex. Um, on the whole, it has vastly more potential to do good than bad. And I think you know, you know, Jeff talked to that nature of knowledge being improved through AI. And I think um, one of the things that I've learned, the beauty of AI is that it can remove that complexity that I talked to and give you that system-wide understanding that decision makers are always after in near time. So there's kind of the things maybe that they should know. Um, what should they do? Be really clear about your problem because the AI is only as good as what you put into it. So we need to know those, those problems. Um, and there are actually, in the central agencies of government, there are innovation teams that want to help drive this along. So reach out to them. Um, and yeah, participate in our survey because then we like get more data and we can help you be better. So plug there. Right. And Alan and Reid, I was fascinated in your project about the new sources of data because... In, in my background, I, I was chair of the National Sustainability Council for the Australian government that reported on Australia's sustainability. And one of our key findings was that the data on biodiversity and on impacts on nature is just terribly uh, sparse. And that's been the finding of most state of the environment reports also. And I'm wondering how you see the sort of work that you're doing now starting to inform reports like the State of the Environment report. Thanks, John. Look, overall, I agree. <laughs> there is a sparsity of data, especially in a country like Australia, where many of the species aren't even identified, uh, let alone do we understand where they are and how they interact with one another. And so by looking to these non-traditional data sources, and using AI and machine learning and so on to, I guess, filter them to a high degree of uh, reliability to weed out the noise, 
we're better able to bring to bear on this kind of issue a lot of what we're kind of calling incidental data that may not have been produced for the specific purpose of monitoring an ecosystem or understanding the invasion of some species. Uh, but can nevertheless, if we're careful and we look at it through a kind of a new lens, can nevertheless shed a lot of light on the kinds of issues that, that we need to understand in order to do well by our, um, especially Australian, but, but global biodiversity. Great. Well, unfortunately, we're running out of time, but I really would now like to turn uh, to Professor Joanna Batston, uh, who is the, the inaugural director of the Monash Data Futures Institute. And we're incredibly fortunate at Monash to have uh, Joanna as our first director, given her extensive background in uh, data science. And Joanna, can I ask you as the director, the first director of the Monash Data Futures Institute, what are your hopes for what these projects can achieve? And where are the gaps that you see in uh, demonstrating the value of AI for good? Thank you, John. I think we've heard this afternoon that it's pretty clear that artificial intelligence is really going to change the world in dramatic ways in the near future. Uh, as, as we've heard these stories, our economy, our society, jobs of the future, cultural connections, the, the data futures for society is going to be incredibly different as we look to the future. So the Monash Data Futures Institute is a tremendous way for us to pull together all of these fabulous projects with this notion of cross interdisciplinary research. So it's a pretty exciting role and I'm delighted that we have this partnership here with the sustainability efforts across Monash as well. Now, as I think about what we've heard this afternoon, one of the things that I think is gonna be really clear for everybody is that it's really hard to be successful with AI without data that's ready for AI. As we've listened to these presentations, we've heard about an intense need for focus of data readiness, whether that's data from Northern Queensland, data around migration of toads, data around the Monash Clayton precinct. In order for us to drive insights from AI in the future, data governance, data preparation, data organization, are absolutely essential elements of our ability to be successful with AI. And so a focus on data mm. is clearly one of the areas that we're going to need to see for us to be able to progress all of these projects moving forward. One of the aspects of the Data Futures Institute at Monash that I think is really compelling and unique and differentiating is this notion around AI for good, AI for social good. And that's very relevant in the context of the United Nations sustainability development goals, um, and including areas that we haven't even talked about today yet, including AI for health as an example. And so the really interesting opportunities for this body of work here is looking at how do we take technology innovation and transformation, but look at the impact of those technology advances for societal value and improvements for humanity. So that's, that's pretty compelling. Now, the second relevant point here beyond data is trust. We, we've heard discussion about policy and governments. Uh, we hear a lot in the press about AI, is AI a magic black box? And what's really important about AI is that in order for us to trust our AI systems, to trust business transformation enabled by AI systems, we need to be able to scale and automate and in essence, open up the black box of AI to see how decisions are being made by AI systems. And so that notion of trust and also the ethics associated with how we use data in AI systems is clearly an important element as we look at the Data Futures Institute for the Future. This notion of 
trust and ethics with respect to data governance, data privacy? Are we leveraging the right sets of data? Do we have the right permissions around how we use the data for our AI systems? Mm. Ultimately leads us into a dialogue with governments and framework makers around putting the right guidelines around how we put together our AI systems for the future. So another example is really this notion of practical applications of AI that enable us to scale these projects to have more global impact. Then the third area, John, that I would call out, uh, which is one of the really important things to think about is talent. We just heard five really incredible projects here, many other examples across Monash of interdisciplinary research. But for society, one of the challenges that we face is that skills, people with the right AI skills for us to be able to capitalize on these opportunities in the future, those skills are rare and there is a huge high demand for talent. And so one of the opportunities again in this partnership around AI and data science for sustainable development is in order to advance these projects moving forward for the future, one of the things that we've been able to do through the Data Futures Institute is to launch a pretty exciting new PhD scholarship program where we're going to be able to bring students in and work with the leaders that you've heard today to be able to move this agenda forward and really drive tremendous advances in AI and data science for social good. So very exciting and delighted to be a part of this. So back to you, John. Well, thank you very much, Joanna. And that, that was a great summary really to pull together the whole webinar and the challenges we face. You've highlighted the need for better data, critically for trust and transparency and governance and also uh, talent and attracting talents. And I'm sure the fact that Monash now has the Monash Data Futures Institute and that you're working across Monash will help Monash attract talent. Uh, and at Monash Sustainable Development Institute and in the policy and impact uh, focus of Monash, I think we've got a great collaboration. I would add just one other uh, factor that I think is critical and that is the social impact of the use of AI. Uh, there's certainly a lot of concern about the impact on jobs. Is this going to mean that people uh, lose jobs? And if so, do we have a just transition for those people? Uh, the impact of digital technologies on the global economy is just extraordinary. I think if you, six of the top eight capitalised companies in the US are now digital. That no longer are they fossil fuel or manufacturing, they're digital. But there are a lot of people who can uh, end up being victims and, and losers in that if we're not careful as well. So I hope as this fantastic interdisciplinary project continues, we do have a focus on the impact on people. Thank you everyone uh, for today. Uh, it's been fascinating. I think we're incredibly lucky to have Jeff Sachs drop in on us. Uh, he really is in demand all around the world. And the fact that he was prepared to do that is a real feather in our cap. And I think he will also be someone who will be an ambassador for our project worldwide. So thank you. Fantastic, Joanna, to be working with you. Congratulations to all the uh, project members who talked today. And thank you for all those who have attended the webinar. Speak to you later. Bye.